بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم Friends of the Dar, ladies and gentlemen, good evening. Tonight, we at Dar al-Athar Islamiya with you return to one of our favorite subjects, archaeology. The Dar has been active in this important historic endeavor, both inside and outside of Kuwait. Tonight, the Dar and its 22nd season, cultural season that is, welcomes an important archaeologist who has been uncovering many sites in the Gulf countries as well as Jordan. Tonight, we welcome Dr. Michael Moton, an archaeologist. He is a director at the French National Center for Scientific Research. He is also the director of the French Center for Archaeology and social sciences in the Arabian Peninsula. He was the director of archaeology in Sharjah between 91 and 99, in Hadramut uh, between 95 and 2006, and Jordan 2008 to 2011. He has published several books. The last he co-authored with Jeremy Shirekat, entitled, In the Desert Margins, The Settlement Process of Ancient and South Arabia. Tonight, he will discuss understanding the Oman Peninsula in antiquity, Mliha and Dur. He is, like many other archeologists, they dig in so many sites, and they find so many interesting objects, but somehow they have never found a mobile phone. <laughs> this is a sign for you to turn off your mobile phones, and let's welcome Mr. Michel Mouton. Uh, yes, I will present you today a, a little bit the results of a, a big adventure, because when we start working in the Oman Peninsula, we knew quite about nothing about the kingdom was there. And uh, until the very last months, uh, we had more and more information, and we, try, we will try to reconstitute this history now. So, um, I will take this. I will start this, uh, this story a little bit before uh, the time uh, I want to discuss tonight. I will speak about the Oman Peninsula. The, you can hear me? Yes? Yeah. Uh, the Oman Peninsula, which is only the upper part of this Oman area, yeah? And the uh, uh, Oman Peninsula uh, had uh, a long uh, history and archaeology, of course, starting in the prehistory, but I will start now just in the uh, late Bronze Age, late uh, Iron Age. In the late Iron Age, you have in all the area of Oman, the, penins the peninsula and the Oman Central, uh, uh, agricultural um, uh, communities all along the mountains and also on the coast, which uh, uh, develop uh, the, their activity in the uh, founding their villages on the use of uh, the phalage. That's the key to understand this uh, uh, fertility at that time. The phalage, as you know, it's a technique of underground galleries tapping the water and bring it until the, s the surface where it runs like a river and uh, can irrigate uh, the fields. So in, uh, in the Oman Peninsula, we demonstrate that the phalage was, were discovered by the communities of the Iron Age around 1200 before the Christian era. It was first uh, Walid al Tikriti who found one in the Alain oasis, and we excavate also the French uh, mission, one in Al Madame, and after that we found a lot all along the Piedmont of the Oman mountains. 
Here you see the one in a line, the very first one found in relation with an Iron Age site. Here, the one in Almadam, excavated by uh, our friend uh, Joaquin Cordoba from the Spanish uh, expedition. And the Spanish expedition even found the outlet of the phalage and the remains of the cultivation. You see here the remains of a palm grove dating from the Iron Age. These phalage have been redug in the latest phase. So the people had problems to, cap the, to tap the water, and they tried to dig as deep as possible to have the water. So the water was disappearing. Why? Probably with a little climate change related with the moving of the monsoon to the south. But finally, these phalage were not anymore in use. And we found all the villages from the Iron Age up and down with the doors closed, as you see here, as the Bedouins make sometimes when they move seasonally from one place to another, they close their, their do the doors of the, the houses until they will come back. But here, they never came back. Probably, they moved to central Oman when the rains were still enough to uh, the use of the phalage, and they never came back. So, in this empty uh, Oman Peninsula, there was a new community who came and who settled in just one site, Mleha. That's the only site we know from the 3rd century BC, 2nd century BC. We don't know any other site in all this area, and all the villages from the Iron Age are uh, abandoned. Mleha is in the Piedmont of the Oman Mountains, just on the back of a little ridge, rocky ridge. It's a large site, one kilometer, one kilometer square of an average. It has been first excavated very, in very few places by an Iraqi expedition just after the independence of the Emirates in 71, 72. And after that, a French expedition, where I was a young student at the beginning and after the boss, uh, from uh, uh, 80, 85 until uh, 2011, we excavate many areas. Also, the Department of Archaeology of Sharjah, headed by uh, uh, Sabah Jassim, work a lot in many places. And now, since uh, five, six years, a colleague who worked with us in that tour, a Belgian team, is working in Mleha also in the um, cemeteries, in the necropolis. So, various teams work on the old city, and now we have a better picture of this city and of this period of time. So the city is formed of uh, mud brick houses, simple houses, as you see here, sometimes mixed uh, composite houses by Barasti and in mud brick, and also huge buildings related to the power and to the elites, as this uh, fort, for the excavation of which we had to, uh, thanks to uh, Sheikh Sultan uh, Al-Qasimi, we move the highway to have the complete excavation of the, of the fort. We excavate also uh, the cemeteries. All the necropolis is, uh, extends on the east and south of the ancient city. These people of Mleha is the first one in the area using the iron and having the technology of the metallurgy of iron. We call Iron Age the previous period because for cultural reasons, because they are in the uh, cultural uh, uh, background of the Iron Age, but they didn't know m the metallurgy of iron. There in Mleha, they are the first iron metallurgists. They are also the first ones to use the writing in the region, the South Arabic writing and the Aramean writing. They are also the first ones to use the coinage. The coinage, they did themselves. They have means. The coinage in the, uh, as imitations, it means using 
the um, currency of Alexander the Great, which has been taken by the Seleucid Empire. And so they are integrated in the trade uh, background of the Seleucid Empire. There are also traders, trans-Arabian traders, in touch with uh, 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 very uh, long-distance uh, uh, routes and uh, uh, the commercial uh, cities of the Levant, the Mesopotamia. Here, you have Greek pottery coming to Mleha. You have also alabaster coming from Yemen. You have bitumen glass coming from Levant and Mesopotamia and even ceramics from the Makran area and from India across the Makran area. So, but who are these people in Mleha, who arrived in Mleha, who settled in Mleha in the third century BC? There were no relations with the previous cultural culture, the uh, agricultural uh, uh, communities of the Iron Age. So the first hypothesis was it was people who come from outside the region. And many uh, little things we observe by the archaeology indicates maybe it was people from nomadic uh, origin. But we have to demonstrate how to do it. So we choose to do it by the domestic space, the houses, the dwellings, and by what we call ethnographic uh, comparison, so ethnoarchaeology. So we build a model on the base of what was observed in the 20th century in a traditional uh, sedentarization of Bedouins in Syria, in Jordan. And uh, this model has shows four main characters, which is here the materials, the using of hard materials progressively, the space, the internal space, uh, is, comes, goes from isolated units as tents until more complex uh, room buildings. The external domestic space it's, goes from the, an open space until a closed courtyard, progressively, and the urban space densificate progressively also. So with this model, we observe what happened in Leha. And the, in the very early layers in Leha, we have only post holes, as you see here. So only huts and tents. At the time, at the same time, the people of Mleha built mud brick graves. So it was a real choose of the way of life. They knew how to build with bricks, but they live in tents and huts. And progressively, in stratigraphy, you know, the accumulation of layers we study in archaeology, we see how they go from uh, the first layers with these post holes, as I told you, progressively to isolated units with complex, more and more complex houses. Here in the map, you can see in the periodization of the site, going from A to D, how the complexity of the houses show this same model, isolated units, multi-room houses, and even multi-room houses, including a courtyard. The urban space shows first the thin line, the extension of the site in the first uh, level, so when there were tents and huts. And progressively, you have the construction of the houses in small spots until the thicker one, which is the last phase, phase D, all the site is compact on the middle. You have exactly the same evolution of the dwellings, the domestic space. We observe in the um, traditional sedentarization in the 20th century. Other ca small characters confirm this origin mo of mobility. Only two, the relation with the camel, very strong. The camels are buried with the dead. The camels are represented very strongly in the iconography. Another point, the metallurgy of iron, the hovens for the iron, they are big jars, ceramic jars, 
which can be transported. They have spots on the, on, all around, so we, with ropes, they can hang it in the camels and go with the, uh, with the, the forms. So, why these people settle at this place? You see, we are in the foothills of the Oman Mountains. All the rains are running to the, these foothills. It's a very fertile area if you can control the water. Maybe that's for, wa for that. You see here in winter how the water is running. And the Mleha site is just in one place where you have the ridge, rocky ridge, blocking the water. So a place where there is much more water than in the other places of the, the Piedmont with accumulation of silt, which is good earth and fertile. You have to imagine the site in the antiquity with a palm groove all around, with date palms, the three levels of the palm tree, the fruit trees and the cultivations on the... And in the excavations, we found carbonized all the traces, the remains of this agriculture. You see the here the barley and the wet, for example. You, we found also vegetables, peas, lentils, garlic, and we found even fruit. We found grapes, pomegranates. So you can imagine all these fruit trees and these vegetables all around in the bulb groves of Mlea. They had also all the steps for the herbs, which are part of the, uh, uh, the dieta of the people of Mlea, and also the hunting in the, in the foothills, and the, the, the fish coming from the coast. We found in one, in one kitchen a complete bag of dry fish, carbonized, and so they bring it from the, from the coast. It's not only for agricultural, agricultural uh, reasons, but also the resources of the Oman Mountains were very important. The steatite used for many objects. It's very easy to explore it in the mountains, and the metals. The copper is very well known from the Oman Mountains. The copper has been exported to Mesopotamia since the third millennium BC, and the people of Mleha were still using it and exploring it. And the iron, of course, which is found together with the copper in the Oman Mountains. So, but you, you will see, okay, you have a population who settled there, it's a good place with good resources, and they come from, from where? We have some uh, indications, maybe, from the, uh, for the origin of these people who came and settled in the uh, Oman Peninsula in the 3rd century BC. And these indications came from the funeral practices. I told you the cemeteries are on the east and south of the site. We excavate different cemeteries. And now we are looking only for the oldest ones, from the very beginning of the installation of uh, uh, Mleha in the third century BC. The graves are underground graves, sealed, completely closed by a big monument, mud brick monument, uh, as a, a, a monumental stella uh, built on the top of the graves. We found around this monument sometimes a pieces of facades falling fall down on the, on the ground. And so we have a high of two, three meters. So quite the same than the size of the monument, a little bit less maybe, but we can imagine monuments maybe as cubes or as towers. And some of these monuments have a stepped uh, base like you can see here. Around the monuments we found these uh, uh, stepped battlements decorating the monuments, some on the facade and some on the top of the facade. We can see it by the erosion of the, of the elements. So we, we make some restitutions of these monuments, which have to look to 
to these uh, restitutions, at least. And if you see th these restitutions, immediately to your mind came another site, very well known in the fringes of Arabia, who had uh, monuments of this kind. It's Petra. And let's say the Nabatean kingdom as a wall, because you have the same in Medain Saleh, in Alula. In Petra, you have these very famous facades of monuments. And you can see it's a rupestrian carved on the rock, but it's the representation of these kind of towers with this decoration. But if you explore Petra, you will find some monuments which are identical to the ones of Mleha, but made of, of rock, because the environment of Petra allows to just to carve on the rock these monolithic monuments with, you see on the top, the stepped battlements. The problem of these monuments, you, you have even the stepped bays here. The problem of these monuments, it's they have an internal chamber, and in Leha, never. It's monolithic blocks, completely closed. It's like a stella. So I went to Petra, where I worked for five, six years. And uh, my hypothesis was these internal chambers was, were a reusing of these monuments, maybe in the beginning of the Christian era, three centuries after. So to demonstrate that, we had to found the original, the earliest graves, underground graves associated to the monument, as in Leha. So we make some excavations, and we found the entrance to these early and original graves associated to the monuments. So if you see the repartition of these monolithic monuments, it's like in, uh, in Leha, to the east and to the south of the site also. So we have the same kind of funeral practices in Petra and in Mleha, and from the same date. And in another site also, in Kariat al -Fau. You know Kariat al -Fau in, in the central part of, of Arabia, which has been fa uh, excavated by al -Ansari. But we have very few information about the site. Here you have some photos of the same kind of monuments. You see with the entrance of the underground grave here, yeah? and separated graves, and we have inscriptions and material. They are from the same period, the 3rd, 2nd century BC. And the repartition of the monuments, as you can see here with the, uh, the shadows of the uh, higher monuments, the repartition of these monuments in the east and the south of the ancient city. So Petra, Mleha, Kariat al -Fau, you have the same tradition, funeral tradition, with the same characters. I will not uh, uh, expel them again, but we have this community, and we feel that the people who came to Mleha in the third century or very late fourth century uh, BC, they are from the same cultural sphera than the Nabateans and the people from Kariyat al -Fau, from inside Arabia. They are all involved in the trans-Arabian trans trade. Yeah? So it's tribes involved with this trade, maybe uh, related with uh, the Yemen uh, uh, trade. So, people sedentarized in Mleha. They came probably from inside Arabia. They are related with these other uh, cultures who settle in the same period. You know, the Nabateans, we know also they have an ori a nomadic origin. But who is these people, and uh, more exactly what they, they did, what, what happened in, uh, in Leha? And we, we, we have now a little bit more information about this community in Leha, thanks to the discovery of uh, Bruno Overlet, the Belgian team uh, working in Leha. They discover in one of the cemeteries a very new uh, uh, inscription, which has been published this year. And this, this uh, inscription mentioned the king of Oman. It's the tomb of one servant of the king of Oman. It means we are here in the main and unique site of the 
Oman Peninsula, and even the area, Omani area at that time, and we have the mention of the tomb of somebody who is working, who is attached to the king of Oman. So we are in Leha, we are quite sure, in the center, the capital of a kingdom which was called at that time Oman. And in this inscription, we have a date. If we refer to the Seleucid area, it corresponds to the last quarter of the third century. If we refer to the Parthian area, to the middle of the second uh, century BC. We all maybe prefer the Seleucid area because you know that the Gulf was integrate they may be in this third century in the Seleucid uh, Empire by the expedition of Antiochus in the Gulf and also the integration in the monetary uh, system as they use the coins, uh, they imitate the coins of uh, the Seleucid uh, Empire. We have another inscription in Leha with another date and if we follow the Seleucid era we are in the beginning of the third century uh, BC. So we have this kingdom well installed there in Leha, at least all along the third century BC, called the kingdom of Oman, probably. So, around the first mid-second century AD, we have another site, which is Eddur. What happened? Why this site? Because at the end of the first century BC, it happened something very important in the area in 30 BC, the Roman annexation of Egypt. At that time, the Romans controlled the Red Sea and they discovered the importance of the monsoon navigation in the Indian Ocean. And they want to switch from the Trans-Arabian trade, which makes the uh, spices and all that very expensive. So, they want to control the sea roads to India. And so they make the expedition to Yemen in 25-24. Uh, they didn't really succeed, but they controlled the Red Sea. And so all the long-distance trade starts to shift to the, uh, uh, to the Red Sea, and the uh, desert routes are a little bit abandoned. So at that time, the kingdom of Oman, they want to enter and to have an opening to, this, uh, red, to this, this sea trade. These people who are people from the desert, yeah, who, are, who are camel ridings, they want now to open to this new business related with the sea. So they create the, the site of Eddur on the uh, little... Uh, uh, on the, the actual uh, emirate of, um, of Umago Umagoen. Eddur is uh, as large as Asmleha, one kilometer square at an average, but very few constructions. It's not really a city uh, a settlement. It's a, a, a place where probably seasonally people came for trade when the boats pass in the, in the Gulf in the season of, uh, of trade. But also people was present permanently there. There were some houses, there were some cemeteries, which have been excavated by the international team. We uh, founded in uh, 89, 88, I think, joining uh, the Belgian, uh, Belgian team from the University of Gand, a Danish team, and a British team, and uh, a French team, the, the same who was working in, in Mleja. There was even a little fort as a refuge, but you see all around there is empty spaces, but full of material, showing that sometimes during the year there was light structures and people uh, who come maybe just for trade. But the very important uh, discovery in Eddur, made by Ernie Ehring, the head of the Belgian team, is the temple, the temple of Eddur, uh, which was dedicated, as we know by an inscription, dedicated to uh, the god Shamash. In Eddur, we found a lot of material, 
imported material showing the Im immediate uh, 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 relation with the sea trade. You see here a lot of uh, glass from, uh, from, uh, from uh, Levant. And we know the political relation between Etur and Mleha because in Mleha you have a, a kind of monogram from the kingdom, probably. We found it on the roots here near Horfakan. We found it in the wells and we found it in the coins of Mleha. You see it here. And so the coins of Eddur, because we know that there was a mint in Eddur, because there are a series of coins which are to be found 90% in Eddur, used for the trade, local trade. In the coins of Eddur, you have the same symbol, which is the, the monogram of Mleha, but associated to another one, which is this one, which is the, the monogram of the, the mint of Eddur. So there is a clear political relation between Mleha and Eddur. And we found this monogram also in some seals, you see here, and in the copper ingots which were exported from Eddur, there was this monogram. So, we said Dur, the Oman Peninsula, the kingdom of Oman, enter in these sea trades, right? And uh, progressively, we advance in the time, we are now in the second, third century uh, AD, they will open two more sites, they, it will appear two more sites, the site of uh, Edur still occupied, but reduced maybe, and with a big fortress on the just on the shore, but the site is not so densely uh, occupied than before. And we found in this uh, fortress, in this small fort, two eagles, I found them. Two eagles, you see, in the style of uh, Hatra, and these eagles are for sure coming from the temple. So, and they were just decorating the entrance of the fort. So probably the, the temple was also abandoned, so the city was not anymore what it was. Because the, probably the, uh, the trade, sea trade activity shift to uh, two sides, so Suhar. I didn't have any photo of the excavation, so I put you some photos of Suhar. Um, and uh, we know Suhar site only uh, from one sounding done in the late 70s by Monique Carfran, a French expedition. But the occupation is clearly related to the sea trade with all this Indian pottery, you see, and pottery coming from Mesopotamia across the Gulf. And we have another site also, Diba. Uh, in, it's excavated by uh, Sabah Jassim from the Department of uh, Antiquities of Sharjah. And uh, he excavated uh, various graves and some dwellings now. Uh, it's in the part of, uh, of uh, Diba, which belongs to, to Sharjah. And uh, there also um, a lot of material coming from uh, Levant. And here also uh, combs, very uh, beautiful combs found in Diba, which come from the Indian area. And we found a little piece showing also the relation between Diba and, and uh, Mleha, a little piece in Mleha but the, the pieces from Diba are much more beautiful. So at that time, we are in the second, third century AD, Mleha was this concentrated city, I told you, and uh, we have these houses uh, in the late phase of the development of the sedentarization, including the space, uh, the courtyard in an enclosed space. You have these uh, very short spaces be between the houses, and it's not any more houses isolated in the space. We have these big constructions uh, uh, done by the, the power, the elites, which are the fort, for example, uh, is at least uh, a store area, but also a dwelling. You have the kitchens and all that, and the upper, um, uh, in the upper uh, uh, stair, there was uh, uh, the residence. We found in this fort a mint, which you see here the pieces of uh, molds uh, to mold coins. You can dye or mold the coins. Here you have mold co coin molds, which shows really that these type of coins were uh, produced in, in Leha. 
and you have uh, what we call the palace in the north here, which has been excavated, the fence, the big fence has been excavated by the Department of Antiquities of Sharjah, and we, the French expedition, we excavate the, the residence in the middle here, uh, which was very rich with uh, 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 material preserved because, the, as you will see, the, the building was uh, uh, suddenly destroyed. And we have clearly two floors with a ground floor for the domestic uh, activities and the upper floor as a residence with all the luxury material, as you can found, see here. Thanks to the fire who destroyed the the, this building, we found a lot of uh, small uh, objects for the daily life, which are uh, usually not found as this comes. And you see this small piece of wooden uh, object is decorated with uh, gold sheets. So what is very uh, interesting in this, in this building, it's the very late phase of Mleha, the very end. It's the importance of the importations, even in the pottery, which is really the usual uh, artifacts we need to cook and all that, all that mostly is imported in, uh, in Mleha. More than 80% of the pottery is imported. Here you have things from the Hadramut, from Mesopotamia, all these jars, transport jars. You have all these glazed jars coming from the sites from the South Iran and Mesopotamia. You have uh, uh, Egyptians amphoras, um, um, Mediterranean amphoras from the African coast. You have uh, decorated, painted wares, very fine and very, uh, uh, very um, uh, fragile. Uh, pottery is coming from, uh, from Iran, from India. All the cooking wares, the cooking wares, the things where you cook, are coming from uh, India, you see here the plates, the cooking pots. And so at that time with Diba and uh, Suhar, Mleha was completely integrated in the sea trade of the Indian Ocean. Coming to Mleha, all the material from the North India, but also the, the, the material coming through uh, the Red Sea from uh, Mediter the Mediterranean and from Yemen. And also we found at that time in Yemen, when you excavate in Yemen, in the sites in Yemen, you found things from the Oman Peninsula, showing really that there is an exchange uh, of, uh, of goods. So, this kingdom who appears with the settlement of this nomadic population in the third century BC, how it disappeared, how, how it finished. In the 3rd century, 2nd, 3rd century AD, we start to see in the Oman Peninsula, in Eddur and in Mleha, the building of these forts, of these fortifications, doesn't exist in the centuries BC. So it shows a kind of insecurity growing up. But also, at the very end of the site, you see that all these fortifications, the, the dwellings, all has been abandoned suddenly we found a lot of material in the upper levels. All was abandoned. Nice material, complete jars. It all was in the floors. And thanks to the excavation of the residence inside the so-called palace, which has been fired, we have more information, maybe, about the abandonment of the site the building has been completely fired. It has been destroyed by fire. All the building, all the rooms, the, the, the roofs fall down in the, in, the, in the rooms. That's one thing. So a violent de de destruction. The other element is the one I told you for the rest of the site. It's the large quantity of material abandoned. It looks like a a real sudden abandonment. Luxury things, gold, coins, uh, jewelry, all was abandoned on the site. The th third element, if you see here the door of the residence, the unique door, it has been blocked here. And it has been blocked before the fire. You can see it here. 
But after that, it has been open, probably, because we can see the circulation. So it has been blocked, the unique uh, door, because there was a danger, and it was the, the last uh, wall to protect the residents. But finally, it was open. Because as you can see here, we found 14 pieces of gold, which is, which is quite rare to find out of the funeral uh, deposits. We found 14 pieces, and you see, they are all concentrated around the door. It means you have to imagine the battle, the fire, the people running, the looters taking the material from the, the, the rich material from the residents and running to the eunuch door here and losing part of the, of the material. So all the material is concentrated there. And also, we found 23 iron, a, iron arrowheads in the fort, and we never found any weaponry in the dwellings, in the, in the houses. We found it also only in the funeral deposits. So here, there was many uh, uh, arrowheads. So it looks like there was a fighting in the building. So we interpret the abandonment of this building as it was attacked, looted, fired by enemies. And after that, we have no more any uh, installation, any occupation of the site. And it was by the material we found, by some datations we tried to, found, to, to make, we, we, we are in the first half of the third century. At the same time, the last building in Eddur was also abandoned, deserted. And we don't know so much about Suhar, we have just a sounding, and Diba, uh, which is uh, uh, very, th there is few excavations and we don't have really a stratigraphy. So what happened in the first uh, half of the third century AD? The rising of the Sasanian Empire corresponds to the reign of uh, Ardeshir the first, 224-241. At that time. And we have three traditions, two Iranian and one Arabic, mentioning Oman. So if we keep in mind that Oman was the name of this region, of this kingdom in the third century BC, and again maybe the mention of Omana in the first uh, century uh, AD which could be Eddur or Diba. Maybe Oman was still the name of this region in the third century AD. And in that case, Omana is mentioned in relation with Ardeshir in these three traditions. And this tradition says that Ardeshir fights against Oman, that he killed the king of Oman, and that he move the population of Oman to the coasts to be uh, sailor men. Yes, they, they deport the population, he deport the population to the coast. And curiously, in the third century AD, when Eddur, Diba, and Leha are abandoned, we have only two sites, three sites with Hat, with it, which is the agricultural land of Kush, which are occupied in the centuries after, during the Sasanian period. Kush and Jazirat al Ghanam. Kush is the ancient Ras al Khaimah. You have Kush, and after you have Jolfar, and after Ras al Khaimah. It's in the same area. And Jazirat al Ghanam, which is a Sasanian outpost in the Musandam. So it looks like the population shifts to the coast as it is said in the tradition. So it's the end of this kingdom of Oman, of the culture of, uh, of Mleha. Thank you. <laughs>